Yes, welcome KCC. Welcome, my name is Dave, I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you today. He is risen. Come on, this is awesome. This is the thing. Yes, this is the day of any day. If you're going to celebrate, this is the day to be here. And I'm so glad that many of you have come here. Many of you I haven't seen in a long time. It is exciting to see you here. It's exciting almost to say for the first time like in a long time. You might want to, if you have spaces between you, you might want to, you know, scooch in because we might need more space. So that's an awesome thing. It is so exciting to see you all here today. And you know, what we're here for is we're here to celebrate without a doubt. I mean, you know, sometimes pastors overstate things. This is the most important day in history bar none. This is the most important day in your life, whether you know it or not, in the world, whether they know it or not. This is the most important day in eternity that we get to celebrate today. And you are part of it today. You know what? I love epic stories. If you know me at all, you know I love epic stories, epic movies. This is the most epic story there ever was. And the big thing about this is this one is true. This is not some figment of some author's imagination. This one is God writing a rescue story, and you're part of it. And we get to talk about it today. We get to remember it today. We get to celebrate it today, and I'm glad you're here to do it. Would you do me a favor and stand up and say hi to some people around you? Take a minute to do that. It is so great to see. And by the way, if you're, if you're online today and you can't be here today, please make sure you say hi so that we can greet you after the fact or you can greet each other online. This is a great day, and it's just, to me, it's just, it's just fun. It's just fun to have the energy in here. It's fun to have so many people. I want to make you aware of just a couple things, especially if you're new here. Please make sure you take one of these cards. These are, these are, there were some on the, on the seats near you. Just scan that QR code. And go to that place. It'll take you right to our website, and you can just tell us who you are. Tell us, you know, your name. If you have any prayer requests, anything like that, that w- any questions, we would love to answer those things. And so this QR code will take you there. Please make sure you do that, especially after the service. If God has spoken to you through this service, if there's some question that's arisen, something that you'd like to have clarity on, use this card to do that, okay? Uh, If you're new here today, please make sure you do that. And online, again, say, hi, I'm new, and we want to greet you. Because community is one of the most important values we have at KCC. We love being together. We love celebrating together. We love loving God together and loving each other. And so one of the things, if you stick around KCC, you'll see is we have a a kind of a desire to impact our world. We, we partner with ministries here in Kalamazoo. We partner with ministries around the world. We also try to do creative things. And some of you may have noticed a bulldozer out there, and I just wanted to give you a clue on what that is. We're actually, a couple of years ago for the pandemic, we actually in the summertime went outdoors for our services. And we loved it so much that we thought we're going to build a permanent structure out there. So we're building what we call our stage in the woods. You're going to hear more about it next week. But throughout this summer, we're going to be working on it so that hopefully sometime this summer, we can actually move out there in that stage. We're going to move out there before that on a p- temporary platform. But we love this because it's a, great way to oppor- it's a great opportunity to invite some people. It's a really comfortable, fun atmosphere where you can come in your camp chair or your blanket and just sit and sort of learn together and, and worship together and have other things like food trucks and, and picnics and things. So we're looking forward to utilizing that time. You'll hear more about it next week, but we just wanted to make you aware of it. There's a lot of good things going on here. This is the place to be. We are glad you're here. We're glad you're here in particular for this service, and we hope you enjoy it. By the way, if you hear a song today you don't know, just listen and be blessed by it. Think about the meaning. But if you hear a song you do know, man, sing it out. This is a day to celebrate, okay? Thanks for coming. Separated, the breach was far too 
You know, when we hear a song like that and we hear about this, you know, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied, it can be, it's like, what's up with that? Uh, this washed white thing, what's up with that? Well, and you got to know, as we've been talking about at KCC for the last month, you know, why Easter and why the circumstances and why did it have to happen this way? And you've got to understand a little bit of background in order to really get it. And in order for it to be powerful, for you to say, thank you, Jesus, you have to understand a little bit of background. And so part of the background is this. Our world has been and is in a mess. And if you look at our circumstances, even just look at our circumstances today, look at the big global circumstances. You've got political turmoil all over the place. You've got wars and rumors of wars. You've got all kinds of conflict. You've got finances that are on the precipice of just a, a cataclysmic mess up you've got you've got uh you've got pandemics that we're coming out of i think and we're you know all of these things those are all pressures that are on us and that that has been the way the world has been in in many ways from almost the beginning and then you start to add your own pressures your own situations many of you have faced difficulty because of the pandemic you've you maybe you, your business has closed or you've lost your job or or some way that you've taken a a, a a blow because of that. Maybe your relationships have suffered. Your health has suffered. Maybe some of your family members, you've lost some of your family members. Our world is in darkness and despair. And really, it always has been. It has been from almost the very beginning. And honestly, from our day to day, it's kind of hard to rise above it. Now, you probably know some people in your life that are the real positive people, the people who are always trying to bring light to your day, right? And they're saying, oh, it's going to be a great day. And today, man, we get to work together. And today, we're, you know, we have a great family. And, that kind of, and they try to bring the positive, but sometimes even those people get down. And if you're like me, when you see people in your life that are like that, and they get down because they're beaten down by the circumstances, you realize, man, things really are tough around here. But here's the thing. If we don't understand life the correct way, we are going to miss a lot of what God is trying to do through those circumstances. We're going to completely miss the point of what's going on. And here's the point. Here's the secret. This is a world at war. And I'm not talking about Russia and Ukraine only. I'm talking about a spiritual war that is going on and has been going on since before you were here and will be going on after you leave. It is a world at war. You have a spiritual enemy who is trying to steal and kill and destroy everything God is doing, every good thing in the world. It's a spiritual war, and you personally have a spiritual enemy. We all do. We have an enemy, and he's trying to mess up everything. And as always, he's trying to convince you that going against God's will, against the Holy Spirit's leading, against the Word of God, that's the way to have freedom. And so you hear things like religion, and you think, I'm going to throw that off and go my way. And you think that's freedom. That's really not freedom. That's leading to enslavement. That's leading to bondage. That's what happens when we go our way, when what the Bible calls we sin. When we go against God's revealed will, that's called sin. And that's been going on from almost day one. And that has wrecked our world in many, many ways. The scriptures say in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's perfect standard. Everybody has. You have, I have, everybody in your ancestry has. Everybody has sin in our life. And so we're dealing with the chaos, chaos and the pain of this world in addition to our own separation from God. And it leads to a bad place. It leads to the end. It leads to places like a cemetery, like it's where there's just, I mean, it gets bleak. It's hard to get more bleak than that. And yet, it doesn't end there. I mean, it hurts. It does. It hurts. Many of us have visited places like that a lot over the past couple of years. We've seen friends and family pass on, and it hurts. And there's no way to just sort of magically or, or superficially wipe that away. It can feel pretty bleak. But what if that was not the end? What if sin, death, even the grave could be defeated? What if our enemy, who revels in that, could be vanquished? If a hero, a rescuer, could come in and slay the enemy? What if that could happen? That would change everything. And that's precisely what happened. That's exactly what Jesus did. Sin wrecked our relationship with God. But God had a plan. And God 
had this plan from before the foundation of the earth. God would send Jesus from heaven to earth. And we celebrate that every Christmas when we say it is Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. Jesus, as the baby, was the God-man coming in human form. And, of course, he lived a perfect life. And so he would go, he would come to the end of it and would not have sin to pay for. This Christmas, in a sense, was an invasion. It was an act of war. It was a rescue plan being enacted. And Jesus came with one goal in mind, and that goal was partly fulfilled. And we remembered it just a couple days ago when we celebrated Good Friday, and we talked about the crucifixion, what he did on that cross, and why that was so important. Because he took the penalty for you and I and our sin, and that's why his blood was applied to our account to wipe it clean. He was the only one qualified to do that because he was the only one who didn't have his own sin to pay for. You can't do it. I can't do it because we have our own stuff. He didn't, and so he could. He knew it, and he embraced it. In John chapter 10, we read, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. He says, the reason my father loves me is I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to pick it up again. He was killed a brutal death on the cross, and our enemy thought he had won. But Jesus knew that death was not the end. Rather, he was stepping in for us, rescuing us, redeeming us, and paying the penalty for our sin. He was paying a ransom, a price that only he could pay. He had no obligation to pay it, but he did it out of his love. He paid it by his blood. So if we were going to be rescued, it was clear that we couldn't rescue ourselves. We needed someone else to do it for us, and that's what Jesus did. He alone was qualified. He alone was sinless and perfect. Our desperation drove him. His love compelled him. His death on Calvary, on Golgotha's hill, made our freedom and our forgiveness possible.
nothing in that great Sunday morning the stone was rolled away Sunday morning nothing in that great cause there ain't no stopping love I said there ain't no stopping love and the devil went And then number and was numbered with the transgressions, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors.
powerful name of Jesus. You don't understand the power that he has until you understand the story that we're talking about this week. The enemy thought he had won. The son of God, the miracle worker, the teacher from God, the, the amazing authority, he was, he was dead. He was in the tomb. He was toast. He was over with. He was no longer to be messing with Satan and his plan. He, the son of God was out of the way. The devil thought he had won. He, now he could get back to stealing and killing and destroying everything. It's all over. He could be, work unhindered, he thought. But Satan, your enemy and mine, didn't really understand some of the things like he thought he did. The great news is that he was wrong. There was what C.S. Lewis called a deeper magic. There was something else going on that he wasn't even aware of. He couldn't have known it because it was created in the councils of God before the world even began, before Satan was even created. It had been put in place from way back. This deeper magic said that if a perfect, sinless sacrifice would willingly give himself for those who were guilty, they could be freed. They could be forgiven. And of course, Jesus was the only one qualified to do that. He was the only one who measured up to that. So when he came, he could give his life in our stead. He could give his life to pay for our debt. And that meant that we, the sinners, could have eternal life. We could be forgiven and have life. So death and separation from God would not have to be the end. There was more. First Peter 1, he writes, You know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it wasn't paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was paid in the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. This was the rescue plan. This had always been the rescue plan from long before the world began that Jesus would come in God's perfect timing and pay the debt that we owed. He went to the cross. He paid for our sin. He was buried in the tomb. And on the third day, he rose again, just like he said. We read about it in Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they, they shook and became like dead men. The angel of, said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He's risen just as he said he would. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that I have gone ahead of I have risen from the dead and of going ahead of you into Galilee there you will see me now I have told you so the women hurried away from the tomb afraid yet filled with joy and they ran to tell his disciples and suddenly Jesus met them greetings he said and they came to him and clasped his feet and worshiped him and then he said to them don't be afraid go tell my brothers to go to Galilee there they will see me Jesus God in the flesh had conquered death. He had done the impossible. He had done what nobody knew that he could do or anybody could do. He had conquered sin and death and the grave. And he had risen to life again. As hard as it is to believe, he had even predicted it on several occasions. And now he had done it. He had fulfilled it. Think about that. Think about the reality of that for a minute. And I realize you're here, and so you've heard this story before, but just stop and think about this fact. If Jesus really did conquer sin and death and the grave, then that really does change everything for everybody. I mean, think about it. What fears do you have that can keep you stymied when sin and death and the grave have been vanquished for eternity? What anxieties do you have that can get you to back off and not do what God is calling you to do when all of that has been beaten, when all of that has been defeated? I mean, priorities, perspectives change about everything. Every circumstance you face, your perspective changes because this has all been defeated. This has all been changed. 
our values, our morality. Everything changes. What you do with your time, your, your money, your relationships, everything changes because he has changed everything. And it really does, if it's true. See, many of us know that it's true, we believe it's true, but it doesn't really change our lives. Why? Because we're not really thinking about it. We're not really thinking about what does this mean. This is an amazing truth. It changes everything. When Jesus walked out of that tomb, he changed the world, whether they know it or not. He changed the world for eternity. This is one of, the, one of the reasons that Christianity is set apart from every other world religion. If there was a world religion that had a figurehead, they are still in their tomb. This one is empty. Jesus walked out of this tomb. Jesus has conquered sin and death. He is alive. The tomb is empty. He is still active and is changing lives, and he's doing it in this room, maybe even right now. That's an amazing thing. And this is why we have hope. Our hope is in an empty tomb. Look around. It doesn't take long to recognize the brokenness surrounding us. Division, hatred, fear, uncertainty. The pain we're witnessing is real. And the need for a savior is undeniable. It's this need which broke the heart of God and moved him to do the unimaginable. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son to change our eternity, to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Love on a cross, dying once for all, laid to rest in the darkness of a tomb. Today, as we face so many unknowns, may we remember the simple truth of Easter. The stone's been rolled away. The grave is empty. Jesus is alive. And love has risen. Jesus is alive, and love has risen. Death has been conquered. Your enemy has been defeated. The incredible, as incredible and miraculous and hard to understand as it sounds, in some ways it is the most logical conclusion to come to when you look at the evidence. So let me real quickly look at several pieces of evidence, okay? Number one, he appeared to the women first. Why is that evidence? Because back in that day, women had zero rights. They couldn't testify in court. They, weren't, they didn't have authority in the city square. They didn't really have much authority in their home. They had zero rights. Why on earth, if you were making this story up, would you have him appear to women first? Why would that even matter? He, they carried the message to the disciples. That goes against everything that would have been written in that day and age. So the fact that he ac appeared to the women first was a pretty big piece of evidence by itself. Second piece of evidence, the changed lives. I mean, think about the disciples of Jesus. They went from cowering in an upper room behind locked doors, hoping they wouldn't be noticed by the Jews, to going into the temple and declaring the name of Jesus, that he had risen from the dead and that he was, he was the hope of salvation. They went from, from hiding and, and trying to avoid being noticed to taking the gospel right into the temple. It was a pretty amazing thing. Think about this. The, the leaders, the people who had Jesus crucified and arrested and then crucified, I mean, that's where they were in the temple. And now the Jews or the, the, the disciples that had been afraid are now preaching it in the temple. That, their boldness came from somewhere. In fact, the leaders had James and John arrested after they had healed a, a lame man once in the name of Jesus. They, they had them arrested, put in jail, and then they had them brought before themselves. Again, this is a pretty intimidating body. This is the body who's just crucified Jesus, okay? And so here are Peter and John, two really nobodies, before this group. And they're asking him, why are you preaching in this man's name? Why are you trying to make us guilty of this man? And Peter says in Acts chapter 4, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called on account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, 
It is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God has raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, who has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, Peter said, for there is no other name under heaven given by w- to mankind by which you must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And so you can see the change in Peter and John and the other disciples. You can see that they are different people. Why? Because they knew the truth. Because they couldn't deny it. They wouldn't deny it. It's a pretty amazing thing to see somebody change from a, from a common fisherman who's denying Jesus three times one night to a couple weeks later boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus in the temple. You have to figure out why is there a big change like that. And the change is partly because they knew the truth. Third reason, a piece of evidence that you can know this is true, the conversion and change of Paul. Saul was a man who was the chief enemy of the early church. He was a Pharisee, he was well-schooled in, the, in Judea, Judaic law, and he hated the church. He hated these Jesus people and what they were doing. He was after them, and he got permission, and he persecuted them. He would chase them around. Whenever he would find one, he would have them arrested. And at times, he, over, he oversaw the, the stoning of Stephen, for example, the martyrdom of people who were claiming the name of Jesus. Saul was the chief persecutor of the church until he came to have an interaction with Jesus on his own. Jesus literally knocked him off his horse. You can read about it in the book of Acts. And had an interaction with Saul. Saul changed his name to Paul and became the most ardent evangelist in Jesus, for, for Jesus throughout the known world at the time. He took the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere he went because it changed him. He knew the truth, and it changed Saul into Paul, changed his life dramatically. Fourth piece of evidence is the appearances of Jesus. In fact, Paul would write about that. He would write in 1 Corinthians 15, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That just means that's what the Scriptures had predicted, as the Scriptures had said. And then he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Now, you have to know this. When Jesus appeared, it was a physical appearance. He actually ate food with them. They were able to touch his body and put their hands where the nails had been and where the spear had been. He was physically alive. This wasn't just some mirage. This wasn't just a dream. This wasn't a hallucination. This was him being physically alive and in their presence on several occasions for 40 days after his resurrection. And then he ascended into heaven. And they all knew it to be true. They knew it without a doubt that this was true. And that was one of the evidences, the, appear- the appearances of Jesus. And a fifth piece of evidence, the missing body. I mean, think about it. If the Jews and the Romans wanted to disprove this and wipe this thing out, all they had to do was to go to the tomb and say, look, here's his body. What are you talking about? It's right here. They didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? That would be easy to do. The, the early church would be wiped out in, in one moment. Because if he's still there, he can't be everywhere else either, right? So it's one or the other. Why didn't they do that? Well, because the body wasn't there. Even external historians attribute or or agree with this fact. The fact is they couldn't produce the body because the body wasn't there. Now, there's a couple possibilities. Either the disciples, who were kind of some ragtag group of people, they came and somehow, behind the Roman soldiers, got the body without being being, uh, discovered and hid it somewhere and kept it hidden forever, or the body wasn't there because the body rose again, because Jesus rose again. I mean, those are your two options, right? That's it. And so the fact that the body wasn't there and was never produced is a pretty compelling piece of evidence that it's true. And then number six, and the final one, is the consistency of the message despite incredible opposition and persecution. These guys, these disciples, these followers of Jesus who were changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, because of what they knew. They were dramatically different people. And they lived the rest of their lives telling people about Jesus. Everywhere they went, they spread the gospel message, the good news about Jesus. Everywhere they went, they would not stop talking about it. 
Why? Because it was that compelling, because it was that real to them. Despite opposition that grew and grew and got more and more deadly, more, many of them, most of them, paid with their lives because of this message. They were martyred. They were killed because of their faith and because they wouldn't stop talking about it. Really, literally, all they had to do was be quiet. Just go away. Just keep it to yourself. Believe what you want, just don't talk about it. Or they could have, of course, recanted and said, no, it was all a hoax. None of them did. They were killed because of it. It's pretty unlikely that a conspiracy would be that strong if it weren't true. So why would they do this? Why would they not just take the easy way out? Because they knew it was true. They had seen him. They had seen him on several occasions. They knew he was alive. Death had been conquered. Sin, therefore, had been conquered. Life is available to us. That's why they wouldn't stop talking about it. And that's why we have a decision to make. Today, you have a decision to make. Do I write this off as some, oh man, there's got to be some explanation for it. Or do I say, no, I think it's real. And I think it's real and I'm willing to bet my life on it. I'm willing to give my life to it. I'm willing to acknowledge that he is the risen Savior. He did conquer death. Death has been defeated. Are you willing to do that? If so, that's your choice. Let's go. Uh, so let's pray and ask God what it is that he wants you to do for this. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that in your grace, you sent Jesus to be here for us. You sent Jesus to rescue us. You didn't leave us on our own. Lord, we were in bad shape because of our own sin. And yet you rescued us. You gave your life for us. Father, I pray that if there's somebody here today who has not yet come to that decision, that today would be the day they would come to that decision, that right now they would make that choice. And they would say, yes, Lord, I believe. And Father, for those of us who have already made that decision, I pray that you would renew it and revive us in it. That we would, that we would be stirred up in our hearts and in our minds. That our lives wouldn't be just about those who believe the right stuff, but we would be all in. We would completely go for it so that we could worship you with all our lives. Lord, that we would not back off from this. We wouldn't compromise this. We wouldn't keep quiet about this, but we would boldly share it everywhere we go, just like they did. Father, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for new life. We thank you for eternity and the fact that we are given that opportunity because of what Jesus did, because of your love and your grace through which you sent him. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Till that stone was moved for good For the land that conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs Hope, a crucial aspect of living. Without hope, we give in to despair. Without hope, we give up. Without hope, we see only darkness out there. Hope is a lifeline. Hope enables us to overcome. Hope is like a light in the deepest, darkest night. Where does your hope come from? If your hope is in your money, it is fleeting. If your hope is in your health, it is temporary. If your hope is in your government, it can be corrupted. If your hope is in a person, it can be abused, misused, and leave you confused. This kind of hope is temporary, short-lived. At best, it can only last a lifetime. Unless, unless your hope is in a man who has conquered death. Unless your hope is in a man who rose again. Unless your hope is in a man who offers you life. Unless your hope, then your hope can conquer all challenges. Then your hope gives meaning to your life. Then your hope is eternal. Because Jesus is Lord of eternity. 1 Peter 1.3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hot 
body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion he declared the grave has no claim on me let's sing that again thank you the morning that sealed the promise, your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me, Jesus. So Jesus, yours. You bought our free 
tomb. Never forget that. He has conquered it all in your name. The rescue story that he started is still being written, and it's being written in your life. And he wants to use you to write it in somebody else's life. So please share that story this week. Also, would you please do me a favor and scan this code and tell us how this service impacted you. Whether it just reminded you of important stuff, whether it told you something new, anything. Just let us know how it impacted you. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you have a great week. God bless you. Have a good day. He's alive.